Uh, just in case you weren't with us last week, we're talking about joy and laughter in a series of sermons we're doing right now. So uh, no cranky people allowed. Um, actually, that's not the truth. All right. If you're cranky, show up. We hope you'll leave uncranky. All right. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. It's great to have you. If you, uh, if this is your first time here in the pew in front of you, or if you happen to be on the front row, reach around behind you. There's a communication card. Uh, and we'd love for you to fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by a little later. We promise we will not beat on your door. We will not call you on the phone, but through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about the church. Those same communication cards cards are for our regular attenders. If you have messages to the staff, uh, you want an appointment, you have a prayer request, you want to be baptized, we're going to be scheduling a baptism for the latter part of June. And so if you've invited Christ in your life but never been baptized and would like to take care of that, we'd be happy to share in that. And so fill out a card and indicate baptism on it and we'll send you all the information you need about that. If I could ask uh, you to give your attention to the screen, we have our morning announcements. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Longstaff of the Elder Board, and I would like to greet you this morning and welcome you to New Hope Community Church. And we certainly hope that God meets you right where you are this morning. Please enjoy the service. Instead of our men's breakfast in May, we'll be having our annual event, The Big Shoot. This is an event that's sponsored by Men's Ministry, but it's open to anyone. If you've never been to a range before, that's fine. Just come along. We have a certified professional to help. Plus, we have lots of range safety officers. We start at 9 a.m. and then we stop at 12 and have a barbecue lunch. So we'd love to see you out there. Come along and enjoy good fellowship and good food. Good morning, seniors. In two weeks is our annual Seniors Carnival. The church grounds will be transformed into a wonderful carnival setting. Soft tacos, hot dogs, nachos, popcorn, snow cones, and the Rollins Holy Donuts. Last year, we had a record attendance of 200. Tickets won from the Carnival Games will be used at the dunk tank as we have a great time dunking Pastor Tim and Pastor Mark. Tuesday, May 14th from 11.30 a.m. till 3 in the afternoon. Hope to see you there. On May 19th is our annual Pastor Feed. This event helps us to send the 4th, 5th, and 6th graders to Heartland Christian Camp. This is an important camp for them. Last year we had a handful of 6th graders who were baptized here at New Hope, who gave their life to Christ at Heartland. The way this event works is that we ask you to bring pasta dishes that we can serve for dinner. We also ask if you can donate raffle prizes that we'll be raffling off after the dinner. And then what we do is we sell you tickets so you can eat the pasta that you brought and raffle tickets so you can win the donations that you gave us. It's awesome. So join us on May 19th at 5 p.m. here at New Hope. All right, so uh, lots of things that are happening and coming up. Let me get the clipboard going around. There should, oh, there is another one. It's right there. All right, there's two things on here. Carnival 55, that's this, uh, excuse me, a week from this Tuesday. A week from this Tuesday. We wished it was this Tuesday because it's only going to be 79 degrees. The following Tuesday is looking at 89, all right, which is still cooler than 102 the year before, all right? So, uh, and they're going to make arrangements so everybody's nice and cool. But if you're going to be able to attend, they would love to know so we have enough food. So sign up how many people you're going to bring with you to the uh, Carnival 55 a week from this Tuesday. And then the other one is the pasta feed that Mark just talked about. If you're going to be able to bring pasta or uh, provide a raffle gift for that, please indicate that on there so that we have good preparations for both of those uh, events. All right. Thank you so very, very much. We have a uh, group of about uh, 15, I think, who uh, left on their motorcycles. They're on a motorcycle run after the 8 o'clock service today, and I actually forgot where they're having breakfast today. Three Rivers. Three Rivers. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, we uh, pray they have a great and grand time. As you probably could smell when you walked up here, our junior high kids are out there with a staff that has been making fresh burritos this morning, breakfast burritos. You can get them with uh, bacon, you can get them with chorizo, you can get them with sausage inside it, or you can go meatless if that's your preference. I have no idea why anybody would prefer that, but that's okay. They are accommodating every palate out there, all right?
right? And uh, the, the suggested donation is $5. It's all going towards our junior high kids going to camp. And they will take tips. Believe it or not, junior high kids will take tips. Uh, so enjoy a good breakfast. You can buy it and then go into the bridge, all right? That's the uh, recently remodeled high school room, uh, freshly painted as of 8 o'clock last night. Uh, and so you can go in there and sit down and have your breakfast burrito, or you can take it home with you, either or. There's also homemade salsa to go on the burrito. Uh, mild, hot, or crazy stupid, all right? You can go any of those three, all right? They, they, they have it out there for you today. Hey, uh, tonight is the first, uh, this is the first Sunday of the month, and so we always have a Sunday evening service on the first Sunday of the month. Uh, it will open with communion and uh, a little reflection time, and then we're changing gears. Mark's going to handle the first part. I'm going to handle the second part. We're going to follow up on our, our Sunday morning series on joy and laughter, and tonight it's all about laughter, all right? So, so from about 5.30 to 6, service starts at 5. We'll do communion the first 20 or 25 minutes, and then uh, we're going to laugh a lot. Um, how many are you, of you are, ladies are familiar with one of the favorite stores in Riverside? Uh, I think it's called Black and White. Is that right? All right, that's going to be our comedy this evening. We got Michael J. for about 10 minutes. How many of you are familiar with Michael J.? Okay, Tim. Michael J. is just a little taller than Tim, all right? And he's black, all right? If y'all didn't know, Tim's black, all right? All right? And, and then Chandra Pierce is going to be the other part of it, and she's not, okay? So that's going to be our laughter night. It's like, kind of like Tim and Tim. All right? Except it's going to be Michael J. and Chandra tonight. So you're going to get a little flair. And Chandra has a new movie out in the theaters this weekend. All right? So you can check a little preview tonight. And uh, so come and join us this evening and uh, enjoy some good faith-based humor. Okay? As uh, we learn how to laugh together a little bit. So that is this evening. Uh, if you haven't seen the Facebook post from the Actus family, our missionaries in Uganda, then uh, please go there and check it out. You can see Pearl the newest member of their family. Pearl is the new car that uh, they were able to buy with the funds we raised since their other car collapsed. Is that me making all this noise? What am I? I'm, oh, okay, let's turn it up. Let's move it. Here we go. All right, that's annoying me. Uh, all right, what's next Sunday? Good job. Just seeing if y'all were... This side remembered. I didn't hear a peep from this side. All right? Uh, so y'all, it's Mother's Day next week, okay? Don't forget those important ladies in your life, okay? And it's also the kickoff for us of um, Change for Babies, the baby bottles that we do, and you can read about that in the bulletin. Uh, all right, I've covered, I think, each of those things that I need to highlight. This is really, really bothering me. I, uh, here we go. We'll try that. All right. Uh, let me hit a few prayer requests now. I think I've covered all the announcements. Um, Hazel Wright is not here with Phil today. All right. And Phil has not traded her in for a newer, younger version. That is, that is his great-granddaughter. There is Hazel. She went in on Monday for an angiogram. And they thought a stent. And uh, she ended up with triple bypass surgery, all right? She's 91 years old, triple bypass surgery. The doctor did it in an hour and a half. He told us it was a three to four hour procedure, hour and a half, came out and said she's doing great. And that is just a day or two ago. She is out of the heart hospital. She is at San Joaquin Valley Rehab. And they've just informed her she might not be there seven to nine days. She might be there only five days. She's doing so well. All right. So that is great news. We're thankful for that. Yeah, that's worthy of applause. All right. Jim Lindbergh, uh, another senior in our church, had an angiogram this week, and I understand had a stent put in. So be remembering Jim as he recuperates from that. Shauna Scalzo that I told you last Sunday was in ICU. She's out of ICU. She's out of the hospital, and she is home. She does have some issues, though, with congestive heart failure. So please continue to pray for Shauna. Mike Rasmussen is a gentleman that I met just a couple of weeks ago because he invited me to, to come see him in the hospital through a mutual friend. Uh, the end result of that conversation is he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And uh, that's exciting. That's worthy of applause. Yeah, you can applaud over that one. 
He went home from the hospital, and then after that, he uh, went back to the hospital, and now he's back home again recuperating from some infection. We got two lost people in the middle aisle. There she's sitting right over there. All right, wave at him. All right, there we go. She's over there. All right. <clears throat> Come on down. Come on by. Uh, let's see here. Uh, David Tolbert. David, uh, David married my cousin Shelly uh, about three years ago, and I've been sharing with you over the last few weeks. He's been battling a cancer in his neck. It had come back after treatment. He had been in the hospital. Uh, David has no more need for treatment. David is now in heaven. This past Tuesday morning at 3.20 from Heinz Hospice Home, he went to be with Jesus. And so uh, his service is going to be here uh, this Thursday at 10 o'clock. So I'd appreciate you remembering to pray uh, for Shelly and for her family. I know they would appreciate that so much. Uh, Trudy Hill used to attend our church along with her uh, granddaughter Tamara Gandy and they moved out of state. Uh, Trudy Hill passed away and her service is going to be uh, here in town next week. So remember the Gandy family. Danny Sieber, Danny way back there. He's the one who runs our computer during our services and Danny's cousin we had been praying for for a couple of weeks. Uh, Greg passed away and uh, I'll be sharing in that service at the bridge this coming Saturday. So please remember uh, Danny and Greg's families. Um, Bernie Silva, all right. Um, uh, I've known her, members of her family for many, many years and uh, had the opportunity to uh, honor her this past, uh, this past week. So please remember the, uh, uh, the Silva family, if you would, please. And then the Fugman family. If you've been around Clovis very long, uh, you probably know of Jim Fugman, uh, administrator in the school district. His mother passed away and her service was here last Last Friday. So please remember to pray for the Fugman family. Those are just some of the updates we wanted to share with you. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, wait on us this morning as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, I love you. Thank you so much for this incredible privilege that is ours to share in not only worship of you, but an opportunity for us to open our hearts and our wills and our minds to your leadership. As the scripture is opened, I pray that we will give your spirit freedom to speak to us, not to hear the words that, that Tim has to say, but Father, to hear the words that God has to say to each of our hearts. Um, and Father, sometimes, it's, it's fascinating to me, sometimes people say, man, God really spoke to me at the sermon today, and they'll tell me what they heard, and I didn't say any of those things. And that means that they are listening to your voice in their heart as the Scripture speaks to them. And so, Father, I pray that you will have great freedom to speak to us uh, out of your word today, that it will challenge us to live the life that you've called us to. It's a life of peace. It's a life of joy. It is a life of contentment in the midst of a troubled world. We experience this quality of life not because we live in a world that is peaceful and a world that is contented. Father, we live in a very troubled world and a troubled society, and yet your word says in the midst of that turmoil, your life can experience peace, and your life can experience joy, and your life can experience contentment. This is an inside-out relationship, not an outside-in experience. Help us to grow in our understanding of what that means. Father, thank you for those who have prepared to lead us in worship today. You've gifted them with the abilities to, to play various instruments. You've gifted their vocal cords to hit notes that some of us could never, ever achieve. And Father, you use them to speak your word to our hearts with a melody. And so thank you for their giftedness and thank you for the availability of their giftedness to your church today. And we pray they'll have great freedom as they lead us in worship. Father, thank you also for the privilege of giving and sharing today. It's an expression of our confidence that you were a God that's big enough to care for us. You're a God who was big enough to be victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and you rose again. And that, Father, if you could do that with physical life, you could more than do that in every area of our life, including our resources. So thank you for the privilege of testifying to our confidence in you. Dear Lord, for, um, for lives that you may change today, not because of how awesome any of us here that may be on the platform are, but Father, because of the presence of your Spirit in our midst who wants to speak to us this incredible message of love, hope, and transformation. Thank you for those gifts that you bring to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
as we were singing that, that captures what a personal relationship with Jesus is all about. You see, until at some point we come symbolically to the foot of the cross because that's where we understand what sin is. Until we see the price that was paid in the death that Jesus died for us, we don't understand what our sin has done. So at the cross where I first saw the light, and when we see that light, the burden of sin in my heart is now rolled away. It is there on the basis of faith. You can't, you can't work to get it. You can't pay enough money to buy it. But only by faith do I receive my sight. And then, which fits beautifully in today's sermon, now I am happy all the day. So I want to pause before I ever preach this morning. If you're here and you've never invited Jesus Christ in your life ever before, you don't have to wait till the end of a sermon. But if through that message of the song you realize, hey, I, I believe in the Easter message. I've just never, I've never given my life to Christ. Why don't you pause with me right now? We're just going to pray. You don't have to come forward. You're not going to have to stand up or raise your hand. But at this moment, okay, at the cross, there, there's a cross right there, and there's a cross behind that screen. I realize the debt that Jesus paid for my sin. I want the burdens that I've carried of my guilt and my condemnation to be gone. And I want to live happy all the day. Let's just pray. No fancy formula, no special words. Just an honor confession. God, I need you. I want you. Thank you for doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Come live in my life right now. It's what it means to be a Christian. No religious do's and don'ts. No membership anywhere. Just realizing you have a need for God and God loves you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can have that that new life moment, that being born again, being saved, salvation, whatever word our culture has taught us. But it can come at any moment at any time, even in the middle of a music service. There's someone here who was moved by the message of the music, which is really the truth of the scriptures today. They realize they've never invited Christ in their life. I pray that they're doing that right now in the quietness of their heart, using their own words, saying, Lord Jesus, I believe in the life you lived. I know about the death you died, and now I trust in the resurrection of Easter Sunday morning. I want you to come. Forgive me of my sin. Live within my life. I don't know what all that's going to mean, but I can't wait to find out in the days and the weeks and the months and the years to come. But thank you, Lord Jesus. I had this moment to invite you in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We're involved in a series we just started last week. Uh, of the subject of joy and laughter. You never can have too much. You only can, oh, don't, oh, bring that back down. You got a picture to put up. They might not have told you. There's a picture should be on that board back there. Uh, I want, and, and, and so we're gonna look at the subject of joy and laughter and that how as Christians we need to smile and enjoy life with laughter. Uh, and it's biblical, all right? This is not the power of positive thinking. This is, these are biblical truths and principles. And so I don't know what your week has been like, but let me start out with a picture that ought to put a smile on your face. Not that one. <laughs> But we're getting there. Can you, can you blow it up? Is that as good as we can get? Okay. Can you all see that from where you are? All right. Maybe by next service, I'll see if we can just, I'll send you just that. You know who that is in the bottom corner? That's Pops. All right. Pops is having breakfast. Now, don't ask Pops about this. I already did. He doesn't remember this. All right. But last week or week before, Dad had breakfast at a local restaurant. All right. I think that might be Sandy's. And that young man that dad's got his arm around, he was sitting with his dad in the restaurant. And that young man said to his dad at the restaurant, look dad, that's a World War II vet. Dad said, yeah it is. And he said, well, no World War II vet ought to have breakfast alone. <laughs> and he went over and asked my dad if he could have breakfast with him. And, and the, the post, which you can't read up there, is his dad is, is Conrado Martin. And he said, I was a proud dad. He went over and found out that veteran was in World War II. He was on the front lines. He got a Purple Heart. He got a Bronze Star. 
And then he says, uh, if any of you know this guy, this young man, <laughs> I'd like to reach out to him again. And so Shelly has been put into play, a phone number for here at the church, and Dad will get a chance to meet that young man again. But doesn't that put a smile on your face? All right. A young guy. We, we often hear... We often hear crappy stories about young people in our generation, and I want you to know there's a whole lot of good ones out there, and there's one of them right there. And, uh, I didn't. I, that's fresh off the press, folks. I, I, Shelly texted that to me at about 6.40 this morning, all right? First time I saw it. I invite you to turn to the book of Proverbs. We're going to be looking at a few verses in chapter 14 and 15. So if you want to find Proverbs 14 and 15, you all ought to know how to find Proverbs very well by now. We preached out of it last Sunday, and on May 1st, you all started reading a chapter a day, right? Yeah. How many of you remembered the assignment I gave you? All right. Look at you. How many have just forgot? Okay. All right. How many of you had no intention of doing the assignment? <laughs> it's okay. If you forgot or you weren't here last week, here's what I suggested. The book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. The month of May has 31 days. So this is a perfect month for the book of Proverbs to read a chapter a day to keep the devil away. Okay? <laughs> chapter a day. All right? Uh, is great. And then as you're visiting with each other in the adventure of the week or even here on Sundays or in your small group Bible studies, you can talk about what was the most outstanding verse in that chapter that you read that day. All right? There are no other homework assignments. I'm not asking you to do questions. Just read a chapter every day. And here's the good news. If you didn't get started last Wednesday, this is only the fifth. So you only have four other chapters to catch up. Do that before your nap today. Okay? And then tomorrow, everybody will be on May the 6th. All right? Last week, we looked at the fact that laughter really is the best medicine for a host of ailments that we experience in life. This morning, what I want to do is define laughter a little more and look at a few other passages in Proverbs to give us some direction on the subject. If you were to go to Webster's Dictionary, you would find this definition. Laughter is to express certain emotions, especially mirth or delight. Now, we don't often hear that word mirth anymore, so I just want to make sure you know I didn't say myrrh like gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's a, 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 an anointing oil for a dead body, okay? That's not what we're talking about here. Laughter is mirth or delight by a series of spontaneous, usually unarticulated sounds, often accompanied by corresponding facial and bodily movements. I don't know about you, but that definition makes me want to laugh. <laughs> This thing called laughter is a funny thing, and that's no pun intended. When we laugh, our body performs rhythmic, vocalized, expiratory, and voluntary actions. Did you realize when you laugh, 15 different facial muscles contract, and there is this electrical stimulation of the zygomatic major muscle. I didn't even know I had one of those, all right? I got a zygomatic major muscle. Now, that's the muscle that goes from the cheekbone all the way to the corners of the mouth. It's that muscle that raises the corner of the mouth when a person smiles. Some of you haven't been acquainted with that muscle in a long, long time. <laughs> Currents of varying intensity produce a wide range of facial responses. The respiratory system is upset by the epiglottis half-closing. It's another one of those words I didn't know I had in me. So that the air intake occurs in irregular gasps rather than calm breaths. Under extreme circumstances, our tear ducts are activated so that while the mouth is opening and closing, there is a struggle for a sufficient amount of oxygen uh, as we're taking air in and the face becomes moist and often red. Noises often accompany this odd behavior ranging from controlled snickers, escaped chortles, spontaneous giggles, to ridiculous cackles, to noisy hoots, uproarious goofaws, and just an old-fashioned belly laugh. Isn't laughter an amazing thing? It's a tension dissolver. It's an antidote to anxiety. It's like a tranquilizer, but without any side effects. It's free. No need for a doctor's prescription. Laughter is, I love this one, laughter is life's shock absorber. If we want to have less stress in our lives, we need to learn to laugh in our circumstances. You and I must learn to find the fun in the frustrating Someone once asked President Lincoln how he survived the Civil War. 
And he said, if it hadn't have been for laughter, I could never have made it. Many famous comedians grow up in difficult circumstances and poor neighborhoods. They coped with their troubles by learning how to laugh in the midst of a troubled life and even how to make others laugh in the midst of their troubles. You and I as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to learn to laugh more. In fact, there's some of you just need to learn to laugh. We don't do it near often enough. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe the teacher. The scripture teaches and principles. If we can laugh at it, we can live with it. If we can laugh at it, we can live with it. And besides, if we learn to laugh in the midst of our problems, we will never run out of anything to laugh at. Because life is full of frustrating and maybe funny situations. Let me share with you a few philosophical quotes from some rather famous people. First one is Will Rogers. You have no idea who Will Rogers is, do you? Mr. No, not Mr. Rogers, but good. All right. That's very good. Perfect. See, you made us laugh. All right. You did. You were right. We rehearsed that quite well, didn't we? Thank you. Will Rogers is dead and in heaven now. So he's alive, more alive than he's ever been. But uh, Will Rogers was kind of a stand-up comedian about life during his day. And he said, I don't know any jokes. I just watch the government and report the facts. <laughs> oh, would he not have a heyday today? <laughs> Teresa of Avila. All right, I don't think she's any relation to Joe Avila, who's out there making breakfast burritos. Uh, she was a nun, a Spanish nun. And she said, she who laughs, lasts. She used to look for novices in her field of work who knew how to laugh, eat, and sleep. She believed if they ate heartily, if they slept well, they were more likely to be free of serious sin. If they ate heartily, they were more likely to be healthy. And if they laughed, they had the necessary disposition to survive a difficult life. There's a Jewish proverb that goes like this. What soap is to the body, laughter is to the soul. It's time some of y'all had a bath. Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens said... Laughter is the greatest weapon that we humans possess, and it's the one we use the least. Abraham Lincoln on another occasion said, if I do not laugh, I would die. Henry Ward Beecher said, mirth, there's that word again, mirth is God's medicine. Everybody ought to bathe in it. Milton Berle uh, Again, you have no idea who Milton Berle is. All right, thank you for being right up front. You're my, you're my guinea pig today, all right? Uh, he's another stand-up comedian from my grandparents' generation. Milton Berle said, laughter is an instant vacation. Alan Alda. Um, 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 did you ever watch reruns of M.A.S.H.? And I am old. you got to educate her a little bit. All right, show her some reruns. Okay. Alan Alda from MASH said, i got to start getting newer material, all right? <laughs> when people are laughing, the problem is the newer ones I can't use in church. Uh, when people are laughing, they're generally not killing each other. Victor Borga, I know you have no idea who that is, all right? He, he was so ancient, I had to see reruns, all right, of Victor Borga, but absolutely hilarious at the piano, all right? Absolutely hilarious. Laughter, he said, is the shortest distance between two people. Quincy Jones said, I've always thought that the big laugh is a really loud noise from the soul saying, ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? And then the most famous author of all is the one who goes by the handle unknown. Unknown wrote, love may make the world go round, but laughter keeps us from getting dizzy. Sometimes all you and I can do in the circumstances of life is laugh. In the Bible, 
the word heart, it can be the center of focus or passions. This microphone is annoying me. I got to rearrange things here. All right. All right, let's do this. Here we go. All right. First off, take my advice. Acquire a sense of humor. If you don't have one, it's not too late for you. Learn to laugh. It's, you'll find it relaxing and healing, and it's a buffer to all the stresses the world throws our way. In the Bible, particularly in the book of Proverbs, the term the heart, it can be the center or focus of our passions, the center of the thought process, and even the springboard for our conscience. The term heart in the book of Proverbs is frequently associated with what is now meant by our mind, that organ that we think with, our will, that process that we make decisions with, and the emotions, the expression in which our feelings uh, find a, a, a release from. Uh, theologically, we refer to this as our soul, our mind, our emotions, and our will. And Proverbs again and again refers to it as the heart. In fact, nearly 50 occurrences of the word heart is found in the book of Proverbs. In fact, maybe a nice exercise to do. This is only a suggestion, not an assignment. Maybe as you're reading one chapter a day, highlight with a yellow marker or circle with your ink pen the word heart every time you come across it in the book of Proverbs. And then when you get to the end, add them all up and see if 50 is about right. I want to call your attention over these next couple of weeks to a few of the passages that talk about the heart in the book of Proverbs. Let me go back in time oh, just before we read our first Proverbs passage and say, any of you remember the Burma shave signs? You don't. Okay, I, I know that. It, they, they were almost gone by the time I started driving. But Burma Shave used to have these signs staggered on the old Route 66, particularly in other, other state highways. And uh, here's just a couple. They were very pithy little sayings that once they got in your head, you could hardly forget them. Here was one of them. Within this veil of toil and sin, your head grows bald, but not your chin. And then it would say Burma shave underneath it. All right, another one is don't lose your head to gain a minute. You need your head. Your brains are in it. Burma shave. Like these short, pithy little statements, Proverbs has short statements that God designed to stick with us. But God's Proverbs remind us of how God wants us to live daily in life. This is not pie in the sky. This is moment by moment, day by day lifestyle. Even our bodily health is affected by our spiritual moods. Voltaire said, the practice of medicine is amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Spiritual, emotional, and physical health are related. So let's take a look. Look at Proverbs 15, verse 13. Proverbs 15, 13. This is where we learn that joyful hope in the heart puts a smile on the face. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. The New American Standard renders that same verse like this. A joyful heart makes a cheerfully good face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. Inner feelings, whether they come from joy or sadness, should find a, a, a release in an exterior expression. To be joyful, to be joy, cheerful, <laughs> to be joyful and cheerful, I just made a new word up. <laughs> joyful. <laughs> joyful. <laughs> See, it made you, put, made you smile, didn't it? <laughs> to be joyful is to be glad, merry, and cheerful. Inner joys should show on a person's face. When we're happy on the inside, our faces should be able to show it on the outside. But this morning, when I came to my office, I needed to get online and I discovered something. The internet was down. I could bring things up on my screen, but I couldn't send them to Mark and Milo for this morning's service. Some of you have a break in communication between the joy in your heart and the expression on your face. We need to learn to fix that connection. See, some of us sometimes show the antonym of joy. Do you remember your English? What's an antonym? The opposite, right. 
I came across a great antonym of joy definition this week. Let me share it with you. Discouragement is dissatisfaction with the past, distaste with the present, and distrust for the future. Any of you have trouble with that? Discouragement is ingratitude for the blessings of yesterday. It is indifference to the opportunities of today. And it is insecurity regarding your strength for tomorrow. Define you at all? It is unawareness of the presence of beauty. It is unconcern for the needs of our fellow man. And it is unbelief in the promises of old. Discouragement. It is impatience with time, immaturity of thought, and listen to this last one, and it is impoliteness to God. Happiness and depression are issues of the heart. What a person is inwardly has more lasting impact on their emotional state than do their circumstances. Some people seem to hold up pretty well under difficult circumstances, better than others, and often it's tied to some kind of inner strength. For those of us, though, who go by the name of Christian, it's not an inner strength that you can produce or I can produce. It is an inner strength that God has provided that you and I need to learn to depend upon. Nehemiah wrote in chapter 8, verse 10, these words, the joy of the Lord is my strength. A few of you know that verse. Nehemiah 8.10, we sing it sometimes in church. I wonder if I tried singing it, if I would sound like Kepler since I'm using his mic. <laughs> no, I better not try it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And you need to understand when Nehemiah wrote that, life was not good for him. He had gone back to a devastated city he had been raised in. Jerusalem had been wiped out. He was going back to rebuild the walls that had been torn down. And when he showed up with a working crew, the people who lived in Jerusalem didn't want him to rebuild the wall. The enemies who tore the wall down didn't want him to rebuild the wall. He had criticism from his own family. He had criticism from the community. He had criticism from, from the other nations around him. And Nehemiah said, in the midst of all of this trouble, the joy of my Lord is my strength to accomplish the purpose that God has for me. You may be in a set of circumstances that does not put joy on your face or in your heart. But understand, you are not to allow outward circumstances to dictate the joy of our heart. That is a personal choice and a relationship with Jesus Christ that is abiding. Body language often communicates a lot without words. The shrug of a shoulder, the I never could do it, but the raising of an eyebrow, a false smile, a downturned mouth, a nod. All of these can speak clearly even when no sound is heard. Sit on a shopping mall bench and study the faces of those who pass by. Listen to snatches of conversations and catch the emotions that are being expressed. Soon the evidence of a broken spirit will become obvious in someone by both words and their body language. A pretended cheerfulness is difficult to maintain for long. Since this subject of, oh, I can't move. <laughs> this is like tying the hands of an Italian and expecting him to talk, all right? Um... This series of joy and happiness is in the middle of a theme that we're going to talk about all year, which is sharing our faith. It's, if, if this faith we have in Jesus Christ is so important to us, and it's so valuable to us, it's so life-changing for us, and why is it we want to keep it to ourselves and why we don't share it with others? And we spent the first three months really looking at the subject of personal evangelism, and it's still our theme, and we're coming at it from different directions. And here's another direction. When you go to the mall or when you're going through stores, shops, when you're at the workplace, look at people's expressions, look at their body language, see what's going on, observe what's happening around you, and, and, and ask God, is this an open door for me to interject Jesus into the story? Sometimes we have tunnel vision. 
Last Friday, a week ago, your pastor experienced tunnel vision. It was, um, we had been given, provided tickets, given tickets for the uh, giant Yankee baseball game on Saturday. And uh, we had decided that we would leave, uh, actually our first intent was to leave Thursday afternoon and, uh, and, and kind of finish our anniversary honeymoon, all right, that we didn't finish in December because I got sick. And then uh, circumstances were of such a nature that it, it wasn't going to be good to leave on Thursday. And so, okay, we'll get up and we're going to get out of town Friday morning at 8 o'clock. Stopping. I could have breakfast in Los Banos at Eddie's. Homemade sausage with his special salsa on top. Oh, God. I travel to eat, you know. And uh, again, circumstances, uh, we, we had a, a variety of folks in the hospital and surgeries and it just needed to see and so I said, no problem, we, it's not that big, we'll get up there in time for a great dinner and we'll leave at noon. Well, it was about 1, 1 15 before I think we were able to really get out of town and we got through Madera Ranchos and I'm tunnel vision, I'm thinking, okay, if, I, if, we, if we go fast enough, I can get there before the 4.30 traffic hits in the Bay Area. Friday. <laughs> and uh, we're the other side of Madera Ranchos heading to 99 and as we're driving there's a car over on the left pulled off by a vineyard and there's a newly erected cross and there's five boys getting out of a car each of them carrying candles and they're heading to the cross. And we all know what that means. And um, I'm in tunnel vision. I'm driving down the road we get right even with him, and Shelly says, you ought to stop. And I said, why? She said, well, pray with them. I said, well, they're praying. <laughs> they got candles. They got candles. <laughs> we keep going, and a little further, and we're past them now. And think, okay, we're, we're finished with this. And I feel these eyes. <laughs> And she says, there's no traffic. You can flip a U.E. <laughs> and I said, babe, we're already past. It's too late. I, I missed the moment. And she said, no, you haven't. Don't. And so that voice, along with the voice here, I flipped around and I said, okay, I tell you what. If they're inside their car and ready to leave, then, <laughs> then that's a sign it wasn't meant to be. And when I got there, they were still outside the car, and I pulled over, and I got out. I looked at her, and I said, aren't you getting out? She said, no, this one's yours. <laughs> said, okay. So I got out, and um, I walked up, and you know, I mean, here's, here's five Hispanic young men. They don't know me from Adam. And... I walk up and I said, guys, I, I know you don't know me. I said, but my wife and I saw you. And I said, our, our hearts were moved. Mine a little slower than hers, but. <laughs> and I said, uh, what's your name? One of them's name was Juan. One was Larry, Kevin, and I don't remember the other two. And I said, I'm, 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 I'm assuming this is one of your buddies. I said, yeah. And I said, when did it happen? He said, last Tuesday. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, it's been a long time since I was in high school, but I said, I lost a friend the week of graduation. Got hit by a car. And I said, I, I know how bad it hurts, and I'm so sorry. I said, I, I'm stopping just to see if it would be okay if I prayed with you and asked for God's strength to be at work in you. And, and in unison, they all said yes. And I said, okay, let's pray. And then those five boys joined hands. I, I didn't tell them to. They just, they just joined hands. And so I prayed, and, and uh, I thanked them for letting me pray with them, and they thanked me for stopping. And I got back in the car and then had to thank my wife for making me turn around and stop because it was a moment. It was, the best, it was the best part of the trip. I mean, Yankees won. That was really good, but... <laughs> And the Giants showed some life in the last inning, but um, the best part of the trip was stopping, and, and I almost, I almost missed it because I had tunnel vision. 
So we have to be careful because it's those moments when we see a message on their face, what we might need to do. So here's a key question. Are only a few fortunate people born with a bright outlook on life? Or is optimism an attitude we can learn? I want to suggest to you, as I talked about last week, this is not the power of positive thinking because at some point we come to an end of our limits. This is a biblical thought principle that directs us towards the power that comes from thinking biblically, and it is also very positive. Susan Vaughn, author of a book called Half Full, says that seeing life potentials and possibilities instead of pitfalls is the result of an internal process anyone can follow. One of her conclusions is there was a powerful link between facial expression and emotion. She believes that people who began to live happier actually feel happier. There is merit in thinking biblically and acting positively when we understand that true spiritual joy begins deep inside of us from the person of Jesus and then it spreads out our life. How do we develop this merry or joyful heart? Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good. When we began by thanking the Lord for being with us and for working out his good in our every situation. It's not that God will work good out of our pleasant circumstances or out of our, our, our delightful ones or our hope-filled ones, but God works out his good in every situation with one condition, if we trust him. So whether it's a screw-up we made that's got us in a difficult problem, whether it's a screw up somebody else made that has impacted my life, if I believe the biblical truth that God works all things together for good, then I can even go through my troubles with joy. My cousin once removed, Shelly, has proven that to me again this past week. And it's her husband, David, who passed away at Heinz Hospice. By the way, he launched from the same room my mama launched from in 2010. And um, I, I almost hate to tell the story, but it's such a beautiful illustration of this principle. I want you to understand. And the reason I hate to tell it is because her husband, David, every time I would see him in the hospital and he would have family members or friends there, I don't embarrass easily, but he made me blush every single time. For some reason, David really liked me. For some reason, the message when I would preach connected with David. And he got his life back right with God during these last three years. And when we went to Shelley's house the other night to talk about the service this next week, Shelley said, Tim, I've, I've, I've come to realize that my reason that God had for David and I getting married was so that I could introduce him to you so you could reintroduce him to Jesus. Now let that settle in a moment. Here, here, here is a bride of three years. They had 36 months as husband and wife. And the attitude is, I believe the reason God brought us together for this marriage so that my husband could find Jesus again. That is a person who has come to understand at a serious level in her life that Jesus is a God who works the all things of life together for good to those who will love him and trust his purposes in spite of the circumstances. A daily walk with God can produce a merry heart if we focus on his blessings. It's not a matter of pretending, but of practicing an outlook on life that reflects our faith in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote from a prison cell with a back that was beaten, bruised, and bloodied. And in that condition, Paul wrote these words in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, just in case you didn't hear me, I'll say it again. Rejoice. That kind of biblical understanding begins with a merry heart and it spreads to our face. In turn, a truly cheerful countenance spreads a contagion of hope and joy to other people. We don't know who will cross our path today or what burdens they may carry. So we need to check the mirror before we leave the home. 
Shelly will tell you, it's often out in public. I will look over at her when somebody walks by and I said, oh my good night, babe. Do, do people not have a mirror in their house? <laughs> Didn't they stop and look to see how they look and what it is they're wearing? I'm convinced some people don't. I was at a high school swim meet yesterday because my cousin's daughter was swimming from down in Bakersfield and they were swimming up here at Clovis West and, and somebody's girl walking by and bathing. They, they, Forget the fact of the size of the bathing suit. The size of the bathing suit and the size of the person wearing the bathing suit did not go together. <laughs> it was not a good fit. And I simply said, do people not look in a mirror before they go in public? Now, if we say that about our dress, as believers, shouldn't we do the same thing about our expression? Shouldn't we pause and look in the mirror before we leave the house and say, what's the world going to see when they look at this face? They look at my demeanor. Are they going to see someone filled with joy or someone who is always down in the mouth? We should pause to pray before we leave home. Lord, help me reflect your deep joy and love as I encounter people today. We know from various studies and research and writing experiences of people like Norman Cousins and even locally here, our own uh, um, comedian psychologist Bob Phillips, that laughter can reduce stress, help ease pain, allow us to better manage anxiety, to have healthier relationships, encourage us to overcoming depressive feelings. Viktor Frankl, who was tortured in a Nazi concentration camp, said, there were moments when laughter saved my life. Despite the benefits of laughter, it's not a panacea, nor is laughter always appropriate. There are some things we ought not to laugh at. We probably ought never to laugh at people without their permission. How do we develop a life of healthy laughter? Number one, have the right attitude. You cannot and should not laugh all the time, but you should always be willing to laugh. What's your awareness? Figure out what makes you laugh. Your funny bone is different than your funny bone, and it's different than mine. One's not better than the other, but we need to figure out what it is that tickles ours. And we ought to hang out in environments where our funny bone can be tickled more often. And I can promise you it will not be at a Tim Allen show ever again. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Okay, I'm sorry. Discipline. We need to expose ourselves to wholesome opportunities to laugh. And then exercise. Try to, try to get laugh involved in somewhere about 30 minutes of your life every day. That's just 3% of your conscious day. We should develop an outlook that makes us, that makes room for laughter in our lives. Healthy laughter may improve our disposition, our service, and our witness. It will likely make us more pleasant to others to hang out. Let me look at just one other proverb real quick and then we'll wrap up. Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bone. Wow, that's pretty graphic, isn't it? Spiritual, emotional, and physical health are related. Trusting the Lord and walking in his peace is healthy for our life and our body, but not walking in that joy is not good for us. Envy rots the bones. A person's emotion affects their physical condition. It's well known today. A heart at peace, a mind of health, meaning a healthy disposition, helps to produce a healthier body. The sound heart has the ability to make good decisions in the use of the biblical truth we have. Those decisions come, become then a source of life to this body. They sustain us and enable us to be content where we are. The alternative is to make ourselves bitter and unproductive. There are some people who suffer from spiritual osteoporosis. That's the rottenness of the bone. We got to get over. We got to stop being withered and wiped out because we're annoyed that she got a promotion and he got a raise and they got a new car. We've got to stop rotting the bones. Let me close with this. Um, do, do you know how Jewish people define the word wine? Joy. To the Jewish people, wine is symbolized by joy. The Jewish rabbis had a saying, without wine, there is no joy. Do you remember where Jesus did his first miracle? At the wedding feast, Cain of Galilee. His mother came to him and said, son, they ran out of wine. You know what she was also saying? Son, these people have ran out of joy. 
Now, let me clarify this. This is symbolic. <laughs> Jesus' joy in our lives will never run out. It will never run out. By the way, the wine Jesus made, it was the best they'd ever had. At wedding feasts, the party giver would always give the best wine first. You know why? Because later they don't care what it tastes like. <laughs> they said to Jesus, this is the best. You save the best for last. The joy of Jesus Christ is the best and it lasts. Ernest Hemingway ran out of joy. Ernest Hemingway lived fast. He lived big. He was a writer. He was an ambulance driver in World War I. He fought in the Spanish Civil War. Um, anything he did, he did big. He loved cigars. There's a cigar store in Cabo named Hemingway's. But his autobiographer said, or his biographer, let me say it correctly, Carlos Baker says, one bright, cloudless Sunday morning, Ernest shot and killed himself. His joy had run out. It's a sad moment when our joy runs out. And Jesus said, I have a joy that will never run out. If you don't know him, invite him into your life today and experience that joy. Begin to study the scriptures and find out how that joy can be a part of our everyday. If you're here and you're a Christian and you're not showing much joy, start reading a proverb every day. It'll keep discouragement away. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for life. Thank you for truth. Thank you for joy. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.